So how are you guys doing? Good. Well, awesome. Well, in 2018, the Harvard Business School conducted a survey of over 4,000 millionaires and multimillionaires. And, and they asked them a series of questions. And one was to rate their happiness level on a scale of 1 to 10. And then if their happiness was anything less than a 10, they asked them a follow-up question of how much money would it take to get you to a 10? Now, you need to understand that there were some of these people that had a million dollars in wealth, but most of them had way more than that. And, and so the most you could say to get to a 10 was 10 times your current wealth. And of course, that was the most popular choice. 26% of these multimillionaires said it would take uh, 10 times their current net worth to get them to truly happy. Uh, 24% said they'd only need about five times their current wealth to get to truly happy. And, and then 23% said just, just two times, just double what I have now would get me, me to that level. What's interesting is only 13% of those millionaires and multimillionaires said money, more money really wouldn't affect my happiness level. All of them thought more money would, would make a big difference. Here was another thing that was very interesting about that survey is it really didn't matter how much money you had depending on how much more you needed. In other words, whether you had $2 million or $25 million, you were just as likely to say that you need 10 times more on the scale. But the reality is God did not need the Harvard Business School to tell him that. He said that 3,000 years ago in the Bible. Look at what it says in Proverbs, Ecclesiastes 5, 10 through 12. He says, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. All, as goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much. But as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. Now, some of you guys are thinking, dude, like if I had 5, 10, or $25 million on a scale of 1 to 10 on happiness, I'd be 37, 36, maybe somewhere in that range. But the reality is you probably wouldn't. Let me ask you a question. I don't want you to raise your hand, but are you completely satisfied with where you are financially? Reality is most of us aren't, even when we have different amounts of money, because the reality is it's a moving target. Though we think we just need a little bit more, but as we approach what we think we need, the amount we think we need changes, and suddenly we're not as close as we thought we were. And, and that's the trick or the lie that money tells us, is that if we just had a little bit more Everything would be all right. Well, if you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 24. We're in the middle of our sermon series, Upside Down, where we're going through Jesus' longest recorded sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. It's called the Sermon on the Mount because Jesus preached this sermon from the side of a small mountain. And at this time, Jesus is still pretty early in his ministry. He's already called his 12 apostles. He's already done some miracles. And so these large crowds are following after him at this point. And at this point, he's known as a rabbi, which is a teacher of the Old Testament law. And every rabbi, were, they were all pretty popular guys, and they all had a little different take on the Old Testament law. And their unique perspective on the Old Testament law was called their yoke. And that was the idea of the, the yoke that would go over a donkey or a mule or a, an oxen that would use to lead them in the right direction. And so the followers of a particular rabbi would wear his yoke. In other words, they would be led by his teaching. And so in this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is laying out his yoke. But what you need to understand is this yoke, this teaching was completely upside down from what they thought they knew and from what they'd been hearing before. And quite frankly, it can feel a little upside down for us as well. At this point, the Jewish religion had become all about outward rule following. You, you followed some rules and you did it in a way, hopefully, that people would see how religious you were. But true religion is from the heart. True religion is about having a relationship with Jesus that is deep and meaningful, where Jesus is the very first thing in your life, the most important. When well, the passage today, Jesus is teaching about money and giving, and like so much of this Sermon on the Mount, it feels very upside down. It did to his listeners back then, and it feels upside down to us. And candidly, it can be even a little offensive because it feels like Maybe Jesus is messing in an area and the church is messing in an area that maybe it just shouldn't really talk about. You know, generous giving back to God is one of those 
touchy topics in church. That There's other topics that make people uncomfortable, but I'm not sure that there's another topic that makes people as uncomfortable as generous giving back to God. But Jesus talked about wealth and money a lot. Did you know that he talked more about money and wealth than he did about prayer? He talked more about money than he did heaven or hell. About one-third of his parables involved possessions, wealth, or money. Even when he was talking about other things like faith or heaven and hell, he would often use money and wealth and possessions as illustrations and examples. Jesus talked a lot about money. But at first glance, that doesn't make sense. Because, I mean, candidly, Jesus really wasn't interested in money or wealth in his personal life. I mean, he lived a very simple life. The Bible doesn't tell us that he really owned anything. He never had a place that, to call his own, a home. He would travel from place to place, healing the sick and teaching. He never seems caught up in it. There was no offerings. He never seemed worried about how he was going to fund his ministry. He put very little emphasis on money in his own ministry and life. So if that's the case, why does he talk so much about money? And the reality is he talked about money a lot because he understood that there is this basic connection between our heart and our pocketbook. That money can keep us from following after Jesus as closely as we should. I don't know if you guys have heard of the Knights Templar, but they were a crusader group. They were these religious knights. They all took oaths in the church. They went to the Holy Lands and they fought battles. They protected travelers to the Holy Lands. They were really feared fighters. But all of them were religious knights, and so they were baptized. And the tradition says that when they would go in to be baptized, that they would take their sword into the water. And as they would be baptized under the water, they would hold their arm and their sword up high so that everything went under the water except their sword arm and their sword. And what they were saying is, Jesus, we're giving everything to you except this part. Because we're going to have to do some things with our sword that aren't going to be God-honoring, and so we're holding that back. They were offering almost all of themselves to God. And, and I think for many of us, if we were to hold something up out of the water, it would probably be our pocketbooks. Let's look at what Jesus says about money in this part of the Sermon on the Mount. This is Matthew 6, verses 19 through 20. He says, Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. So Jesus in this first part is saying, don't store up stuff here on earth because it can be taken away from you. It can be stolen. It, it can be destroyed. In other words, stock markets crash. Things lose value over time. He's saying things in this life tend to not hang around as far as wealth and possessions. But he's also telling us something a little tougher than that. He's also telling us that our, our life on this earth isn't going to last very long. And listen to how the Apostle Paul says this th same thing. He says in 1 Timothy 6, 7, For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. In other words, all the stuff that you've collected, all the things that you've acquired, at the end of this life, it won't matter anymore because you can't take it with you. Do you know that when someone dies, the, the last thing the funeral home staff does when they're closing that casket for the last time, you know what they do? They take all of the rings and watches and other jewelry, they take it all off, and they put it in a little packet to give to the family. You know why they do that? Because you can't take it with you. It doesn't do you any good anymore. Several years ago, my parents told me a story about a couple that had moved back to my hometown of Center. The, the husband had actually grown up somewhere around the Center area in northeast Texas, and he had moved away to go to college, and then he'd moved to the Northeast to take a big, high-paying job, and he met his wife there. And they both had this love of horses, and they had a dream of owning a horse ranch one day. So they both worked for like 35 years in high-paying jobs. They didn't have any kids. They didn't take vacations. They really didn't spend a lot of money on themselves. I'm going to be honest. I don't know if they were generous back to God or not, but I know that they scrimped and saved for this horse farm. And so... Uh, they, after 35 years, they were in their mid-50s. They retired early. They bought a horse farm in, in center, and they moved back to start getting that horse farm ready to have the horses of their dreams. And within six months of them moving to the horse farm, uh, he got pancreatic cancer and died a few weeks later. And, and it's a reminder that all of that work, all of that effort, all of that stuff that they had acquired didn't 
amount to anything. They didn't get to enjoy it. And, and I can't tell you how many different stories and situations I know where people have saved to retire early and they retire early and then for some reason, uh, medically or, or the, their death, they don't get to enjoy what they've done. And, and so Jesus is saying, don't store up stuff here because there's no guarantee about what's going to happen. And ultimately, you're not going to take it with you. But instead, use this life to be generous to God. Let me say this in a way that you finance people will understand. Jesus is saying that the ROI on giving back to God is worth the effort. In other words, the return on investment, Jesus is saying, is enough. Now, that's Jesus saying that. That's not me saying that. If you've been around our church for a little while, you know we don't talk a lot about money. We don't talk about money on a regular basis. We don't even take up an offering. Uh, In the two years that we've been a church, I've never done a giving series, not one. I think on maybe two occasions, I've talked about giving back to God in any significant way, more than just a mention. We don't talk about money because we want you to know that you are more valuable to us than your giving, that we want you, not your money. But but I'm going to be honest kind of been convicted lately that in trying to do that, I've actually done you a disservice because I haven't given you the opportunity to be generous back to God the way he calls us to. I've cheated you out of an opportunity to do that. And and, and the reality is my thought process has been, look, I, I, I don't want somebody to come in the first time and go, yeah, there they go again. Church just wants my money and never come back. And I haven't talked about money a lot because the reality is We've had enough giving that we could pay our staff, that we could take care of our rent, that we can be generous with other uh, mission organizations the way we want to. And so I haven't talked that much about money because we haven't needed it. And I didn't want to run somebody off. And I, I think I told myself, and it's partly true, that I didn't want somebody to miss out on following Jesus because they showed up at church on a day I talked about money. But here's the part I want to apologize to you for. I've also been convicted that part of that was because I wanted to grow this church. I I didn't want people to be offended and not come back because I talked about money uh, and they got upset. My job as your pastor is not to grow this church. My job as your pastor is to preach diligently and truthfully from God's word, all of God's word. That's my job. And then let Jesus take care of that. And so for some of you, I've cheated you out of hearing this message about your possessions and about giving. And so, I want to apologize to you for that. Because Jesus says that he needs to be the most important thing, even greater than your finances. Money plays a big role in how you value Jesus. It just does. Listen to what Mother Teresa said. And Mother Teresa is another lady that didn't care much about money in her own personal life. She says this, nothing will destroy our joy of loving Jesus more than money. My job as your pastor is to encourage you to chase after Jesus first. And there's a connection between money and chasing Jesus. And so I want to apologize for that. All right, look at what Jesus says next in verse 21. He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I think this verse is the key to understanding why Jesus cares so much about money, why he is teaching about money. Because there's this basic connection between where our money goes and what we prioritize, where our money goes and what we love. You know, when you've hurt your shoulder or your knee or your back, you'll go into the emergency room and they'll probably do an x-ray and that may or may not show what the problem is. So a lot of times they'll send you out to an imaging center or a hospital to get an MRI because an MRI shows this really clear picture of what's going on inside. And the reality is generous giving back to God It's kind of like an MRI for your heart. It shows this really clear picture of what you value and what you love. When I was in college, I mean, I made no money. I worked part-time. I had, if I had $8 in my wallet, I felt felt pretty wealthy uh, back then. And when I met my wife, Lil, she had to pursue me a while. She immediately liked me, had to pursue me a while, but I mean, you know, can you blame her? Um, but yeah, I'm going to need somebody to let me sleep on their couch tonight. So if you just, you just lift your hand. Um, no, but when we started dating, um, I started spending more money on Lil than, than I really had. I would not spend money on other things. I would take her bowling and I would take her out to dinner because I wanted to show her my affection for her. And she was more important than my money. In other words, 
I spent my money on Lil because she had my heart. And, and Jesus is kind of saying the same thing, that there is this connection between where our money goes and where our heart is. In the Gospel of Luke in the New Testament, we see this story about Jesus that kind of illustrates this truth. Jesus is at the temple in Jerusalem, and here's what happens. This is Luke 21, 1 through 2. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. So outside the temple, they had this big bronze container, and you would come and you would put your money into the offering there in that big container. And back then, they didn't have online giving. They didn't have checks. They didn't even have cash money. Everything was in coins, metal coins. It would either be gold or silver or, or copper. And so the rich people would come, and they would bring their big you know, sack of gold and silver coins, and they'd walk up, and they would dump those coins into that big bronze container. Now, what happens when you put metal coins into a metal container? It's going to make some noise, right? And, and so they would, these rich people, they'd bring the noise, so to speak. And it became kind of a show where you would show up and you'd kind of hang out to see who's going to bring the noise today. You'd be standing in line. Maybe you'd get a little excited when you saw somebody that already had a big money bag or that you saw they were wearing Gucci sandals or, I don't know, a Versace robe or something, and you're like, that dude's about to bring the noise. And so all of these people would come up and they would bring the noise. But Jesus didn't seem very interested as he stood there in the noise that they were bringing. But, but then this widow comes up and she takes out two small uh, copper coins and she drops those into the bronze container and suddenly Jesus hears the noise. He, he suddenly looks up. The, the Bible says that he saw this poor widow and if we go back to the Greek word there that she used, it tells us it was more than just a glance. That he was watching. He saw this poor widow come up to the offering and drop her two small copper coins in. And if you want to know how much money that was, the, the copper coins that she gave were called a mite. And a mite was the smallest amount of money that they had in coins back then. It was 1 64th of a denarius. So now you know what the value is. No, a denarius was equal to a laborer's daily wage. So if we do the math on today's to try to get a value on that, uh, min take minimum wage, multiply it times eight for an eight hour day, and it comes out to about $58. So that's what a denarius was worth. A mite was worth 1 64th of that. So it was worth about 92 cents. So this lady gave about, uh, what is that, $1.81 or something like that, $1.84, a little less than $2. Not very much by our standards. But Jesus says, sees this, and he says something that sounds so upside down, probably to his disciples, but it also sounds upside down to us. Here's what he says. Truly I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put in all she had to live on. Like, more? Jesus, I, <laughs> maybe you got this one wrong. Look, I know you're right most of the time, but more means, well, more, like in excess of, greater than, right? Four is more than three. Four is less than five, maybe I mean, I don't have a math degree, but apparently Jesus doesn't really have a math degree either. Something's wrong here. Two dollars isn't a lot of money, unless it's the difference in buying something to eat or going hungry that night. Two dollars isn't a lot of money, unless it's all you have. And then suddenly, it's a lot. And Jesus starts this statement off to his, to his disciples. He says, truly I tell you. The word truly there, I think it's saying, this doesn't sound right. It doesn't sound true, but I'm telling you, truly, she gave more than all the others. You know, when I read this, this is the part where I think, you know, Jesus, surely he comes in right here and goes, hey, lady, I appreciate your gift and all and to the, to the temple, but you just keep that. You, you need that more than the temple. All these people that brought the noise, all these wealthy people giving gold and silver, the, the, the temple's taken care of. All the priests, they've got what they need. You, you just take that money. Go buy yourself some Taco Bell or something. Get something to eat. But Jesus doesn't do that. Instead, he holds her up as an example of how we should view our money and how we should be generous back to God. He says, she gave more than all the others. And this feels kind of upside down to us. But, but, but maybe God doesn't look at more 
and define more the exact same way he does? Maybe it's not tied to the amount of the giving. Maybe it's tied to the amount of the sacrifice. Maybe it's not about the portion given, but instead it's about the proportion. It's about the heart behind it. You know, in the Old Testament, they were called to give a tithe, which is 10% of their income. Notice that that is not an amount that they were required to give. It's a proportion of their total income. And and so maybe that's what God is looking at, is the amount of the sacrifice. Or maybe God isn't really interested in the money at all. Maybe that's not what this is about. The reality is, God doesn't need our money. He already owns everything. Look look at what the Bible says about this. This this is Psalm 24.1. It says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all who live in it belong to the Lord. Another place, it says all the gold and the silver in the world belong to God. So if God already has it all, maybe he looks at more differently than we do. Maybe, Maybe more is this idea that we think of as something we don't have yet, right? So if at breakfast I go get more bacon... It's something I didn't have. I I didn't have it before, so I go get more. These multimillionaires, they need 10 times more, they think, to be happy. More is something that we don't have. And if God already owns everything, then maybe more is different for him because he doesn't need anything else. And this idea that your money doesn't belong to you is such a foundational truth to understand how Jesus views your money. It does not belong to you. It belongs to God. Around the Christmas holidays every year, just almost every year, I'll have at least one person come up to me and say, hey, I've got some money that I want you to use anonymously to help a family or somebody in need. Usually it's a couple hundred bucks, but sometimes it's, a couple times it's been well over a thousand dollars. And so they'll give me that money and we'll take that and we'll identify a, a family that maybe can't buy gifts for their kids or some people that are having a hard time paying their bills, then we'll take that money, we'll buy gifts for the family, or we'll, you know, give them the money to help pay their bills. When I'm given that money, there's no real temptation for me to go, so what am I going to do with this? Am I going to give it to somebody else or am I going to put it in my own bank account or am I going to, maybe I'll buy me something, I'll buy you, give, give me some more of these shoes because they'll buy about a thousand pairs of these shoes that I wear. That's not a temptation for me. It doesn't even cross my mind. Why? Because it's not mine. I've just been entrusted to money that belongs to someone else. And and giving back to God kind of works the same way. If we understand that it doesn't belong to us, it's a whole lot easier to give it back to him. See, God doesn't need our money. And if he did, we'll let you in on a little secret. He'd just take it. (laughs) He can do that. He's got the power. He isn't really worried about our money. He's worried about our heart. And and that's why it's not the size of the gift that matters. It's the size of the sacrifice. Why it's not about the portion that's given, but instead it's about the proportion that's given. And, And if you see it in that context, it makes a lot of sense why he said that the widow gave more. Because she gave everything she had. That's a big proportion. That's 100% of everything she owned. She gave more because she needed to buy necessities with that. The cost was high. About five or six years ago, I was in the office at the church where I was at at the time, and I was sitting in my office, and a couple came to talk to me. And they sat down and they said, uh, you know, can we have a few minutes? I said, sure. They said, we want to run something by you. And I said, all right. They said, several months ago, you preached a sermon about tithing, and so we've decided to start tithing several months ago, even though it was tough for us. So I'm feeling pretty good about myself. Somebody actually listened to what I said, made some changes in their life. Look at me preaching. But my prideful joy went away pretty quickly as they continued with their story. It was kind of towards the end of the month, and they said, we have kind of a problem. We we want to tithe this month, but we don't have enough money. We had some unexpected expense. The car broke down, had to take care of that. So if we tithe this month... We don't have enough money to pay our rent at the beginning of next month, and we can be kicked out of our apartment. (laughs) Suddenly, I I was a little lost for words. I I didn't know what to say. I I think if I could have flipped over backwards out of my chair and then crawled out without them seeing me, I'd have done that because I didn't know what to do. And I said, look, I don't know what to tell you at this point except what the Bible tells me, and that is that God is to come first, that he is to be the priority, that he's to get the first fruits. 
That's not what I wanted to say. I, I wanted to say, guys, church is doing pretty good financially. You need that money worse than we do. Just keep it. But I didn't. I said, all I know to do is to tell you what the Bible tells me. All I know is to tell you Jesus' words. And so I told them, and they were very serious about it, and they said, we want to go home and pray about it and talk about it, and we'll decide what to do. When they left my office that day, I think I was more worried about the rent than they were. I'd already decided we were going to use some benevolence funds at the church. If they, gave, if they tithed and didn't have enough money to make their rent, we were going to give that back to them out of the church benevolence fund. I came this close to telling them, hey, guys, just hold that tithe until the first of the month. See if you get enough money to pay the rent, and if not, just use some of that tithe to pay your rent. I'm so glad I didn't. A few days later, I got a call from the husband. He's so excited, and he says, Nathan, we decided that even though it was risky, even though it, we didn't know it was going to work out, we decided to go ahead and tithe, and we did that. And then a couple of days before our rent was due, we got a check in the mail. This was some money we'd loaned to his brother-in-law like 10 years before, and we, we'd just written it off as never getting it back. And suddenly there it was. And the amount of that check was just a few dollars more than we needed to pay our rent. Man, their faith exploded. Their trust in God exploded in that moment. And, and they got a chance to give the joy of sacrificially taking a risk, giving back to God. They stored up some treasure in heaven by what they did. And I almost talked them out of it because I didn't believe the upside down truth of Jesus enough to tell them what he said. And I'm so glad that I did. They trusted God with their finances and they put him first. That's why Jesus didn't tell that poor widow to take those two copper pieces back. He understood the value that that had to God because she had put him first, but also the way that she was trusting him in faith and that that was going to pay dividends because she trusted God. She believed this upside down message in the Bible. And if that's true, if what Jesus says about money is true, that don't store treasure here, store it up there, then why in the world would he stop this widow from giving an incredible sacrifice, all that she had? She gave more than everybody else. We have some individuals in our church that, that give significant sums of money to our church, and it's such a, a blessing for us as a church because it lets us pay staff, it lets us pay the rent, on where we meet. It lets us be very generous with outside mission organizations and do lots of things. And I'm so thankful for those people that give those significant amounts of money. But I'll be honest, there's a couple of people in our church that bring me incredible joy. The most joy I get out of seeing giving because I know they just give a few dollars a week, 10, 12 bucks, whatever it is, but I know what it costs them. I know because I know their financial situation. I know what they're doing. I know that they've made a decision to not go out to dinner or to not go to a movie that month because they're giving that. They're, they're giving more because of the proportion, not the portion. And so that brings me great joy that they're giving back to God even though it's a struggle and a sacrifice. See, I, I think there's a tendency to think about generous giving back to God as a kind of a one-day thing. Does that make sense? One day, I'm going to be generous with God. God, I don't have enough money to be generous right now, but one day I will. I've got all this debt that I've got to take care of first. Or I've, I've, I've got a job that I know I'll make more money in the future and it won't be such a sacrifice. So one day, I'll be generous. You know, this has actually been taken to the extreme by a new kind of giving that has been going on outside the church world for a long time, but is pretty new to the church. So... Some people are deciding that they will not be generous with the churches or back to God while they are alive, but they'll will a certain percentage of their estate to the church. Like I said, that's been going on for colleges and other nonprofits for a long time. And, and it's actually a pretty big gift for the university. It's a great deal because suddenly they get this money. Or it's a great deal for churches too because suddenly they get this big a uh, lump of money that they can use to buy equipment or they can put a down payment on a new building, lots of different things. And, and I don't want to take away the generosity of that. There's generosity in that. But I wonder, how does Jesus view that? It, it, you don't really need that money when you're dead. So how big a sacrifice is it to give it back to God when you're gone? And, and I just wonder, compared to what Jesus said about this widow and the widow's might, how does that compare with that? I think there's this tendency to say one day when it's not as big a sacrifice. 
But when we do that, we're missing what Jesus wants. Jesus wants our heart. That's what he's looking for. Let's keep going with what Jesus says about money in the Sermon on the Mount. Look at verses 22 through 23. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? What in the world is Jesus saying there? First glance, it doesn't make any sense, but here's what he's saying. He's saying that light comes into our body through our eyes. And if you're blind, it's going to be a pretty dark world that you live in. But he's saying that with our eyes, we can see and we can chase after things that are good, or we can see and chase after things that are evil. And so he says, if we bring generosity in through our eyes, it affects our whole body. It gives us peace and trust and faith. But if our eyes focus on selfishness and being miserly and greed, it affects the whole body. That darkness begins to flow out of us and it can affect our full lives. It can even affect the people around us. The generosity can come in or the greed can come in and it affects the rest of us and the people around us. All right, look at how Jesus wraps up this money talk in verse 24. He says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. What's so interesting here is he says, you cannot serve. He doesn't say you shouldn't. He doesn't even say, I command you not to serve both God and money. He says you can't. It's an impossibility. Here's why. The reality is money is Jesus' biggest competition for our heart. It just is. Because money promises for us that only God can do. It, it makes promises to us of things that are God's responsibility. Here's, here's what money whispers in your ear. It, it tells us that you can have security. Hey, if you just have a little more of me, you're not going to have to worry about those bills. Cut down your stress. You don't have to worry about retirement. Hey, if you chase after me, you're finally going to be happy and have satisfaction. Hey, if you get just a little more of me, you're going to have success. People are going to look at you as being important and valuable. But money is making promises that it cannot keep. It's a lie. That's why those multimillionaires that have $25 million are still saying, I need a lot more than what I have to be happy. Money lies to us. If, there's a guy named John D. Rockefeller. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's considered to be the wealthiest American of all time. He started the Standard Oil Company, if you've heard of that. And so back at the beginning of the 1900s, he had a wealth that was equal to about 1% of the entire nation. So he lived on 1%. Everybody else in America lived on the other 99, just to get a perspective. He was so wealthy that some of the rich guys today, like Elon Musk and Bill Gates, their wealth was kind of like the widow in this story. A lot of money. And so he was at an event one time, and he was walking out, and a reporter yelled at him, Hey, how much money is enough? He looked around, and he smiled, and he said, Just a little bit more. You cannot serve both God and money. Money promises you things that only Jesus can deliver. Our job is to chase after Jesus with all our heart, to put him first. See, if you're one of those people that thinks that the church just wants your money, you're actually wrong because we don't just want your money. We also want your talent and your energy and your, and your family. Why? Because that that's what Jesus wants. He wants every, ingle, every single aspect of your life. He wants your heart. That's what he's ultimately after. So where are you storing up your treasure? Are you storing it up here on earth? Or are you storing it up in heaven? The Bible says you cannot serve Jesus and money. These, these aren't my words. These are Jesus' words. But if I believe this upside down truth from Jesus, then I need to be talking to you about money. Because I want you to have that relationship with Jesus that brings you joy and satisfaction in this life. Here's what I don't want to have happen. I don't want us to both be in heaven and you come up and you go, hey, Nathan, why didn't you tell me? Dude, why didn't you tell me that we could store up treasures for up here while we were down there? And I have to go, you know, well, it was a little uncomfortable. I didn't really like talking about it. It was my least favorite sermons to preach. 
And we had enough money in the church, so she never got around to it. That's what I don't want to have happen. The reality is generous giving back to God shouldn't be a hard decision for us because he owns it all anyway. We're just entrusted with it for a little while. I should talk to you about money more than I do because Jesus talked a lot about money. And as your pastor, I want you to experience that relationship with him in this life and the riches he offers in the kingdom to come. Let's pray.